of grace upon you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm somebody that loves a good story. Maybe you're there as well. Picture this around the campfire, hearing a story, or maybe you're the one that's telling it. There's just something about a story that captures your imagination. The taller the tale, the better. For me, spending time at the lake is a place I love to be with my family. And it's there that I usually hear stories, sometimes from my father-in-law, about the fish that he caught or is going after. You know, the type of fish that's this big? Usually the fish actually looks something more like this. In the Bible, we have stories about fish and water, and, and God's always in the midst of it, trying to teach us, trying to lead us along the way. And today, if you haven't realized yet, we are talking about the story of Jonah. Jonah and the whale. Whale's not in the Bible. The whale is not in the Bible. So already from a very young age, we've started to kind of have this story crafted in our minds in a particular way. It's about Jonah and the really big fish, and we try to understand if this is true, black and white, if it's a parable, if it's somewhere in between, if it even matters. But we find ourselves in our new sermon series, Rob Bell's What is the Bible? And there's a reason, because these stories don't always make sense, and there's always deeper context for us to try to understand. In our preaching text today, we're told that Jonah was in the belly of a whale, and that he was spit out after a few days. And for us to even try to begin understanding what's taking place in Jonah 2, I think it's important for us to look at Jonah 1. In here we read these words from the message, Up on your feet and on your way to the big city of Nineveh. Preach to them. They're in a bad way and I can't ignore it any longer. And what takes place next is Jonah does what most of you would do if you were asked to go and preach to the land that you weren't comfortable with you'd run the other way. We're told that Jonah literally just goes the opposite direction of what God has asked him to do. And that might not seem so out there for you because, again, we have all been there. But there's something deeper going on here in the story. Nineveh is in a place called Assyria, and the Assyrians were the bad guys. Jonah was actually terrified for his life because of what the Assyrians had done to his people. So when God has asked him to go into this place, he says no. I don't want to do that, God. I will not do that. So I'm going in the opposite direction. He went to Tarshish as far away from God as he could get. So if you could picture Jonah saying this, this is what Rob Bell says in What is the Bible? Assyria, our worst enemy, those hated infidels who have made life for our people a living you-know-what time and time again. You want me to go into the center of the beast and do something good for them? Seriously? Now, Jonah wants nothing of it, and so he heads to the nearest port. He jumps on the ship. He sails in the opposite direction. Of course he does. You'd get in a boat, too. And so the story continues here in Jonah chapter 1. But God sent a huge storm at the sea, the waves towering. The ship was about to break into pieces. People are starting to lift up prayers to their gods. They're throwing things overboard, just praying that they're going to survive this moment. They're all worried, and Jonah's busy taking a nap. There's just something about trying to remove yourself from the situation that brings you peace, even if it is in the midst of an actual storm. These folks are praying to their God. They tell Jonah to pray to his God. And the sailors were told, they begin to ask questions of what is going on here. Why is this taking place? And so they start to draw straws. They want to know who's the reason behind this disaster. He says, I'm a Hebrew. I worship God, the God of heaven and earth, who made the sea and the land. And it's at this point that we're told the sailors become frightened. They are fearful of what God is doing and what God is going to do to them. So the story continues. In asking him what to do, Jonah offers himself up as the sacrifice. He says, throw me overboard. Get me out of here. This is what you need to do. These sailors, they don't want blood on their hands. They don't want to feel like they're the reason why this man died. And so they try to go the opposite direction. They start paddling, they make their way, and the storm, we're told, gets even worse. Finally, they decide to grab him, throw him into the water, 
and we're told that he's swallowed by a really big fish. He spends time in there for three nights. So let's catch up a little bit here because there's a whole lot going on. God calls, Jonah runs, Jonah's swallowed by a fish, Jonah's spit out by the fish, and now we hear that God begins to call again because God hasn't given up on Jonah even when Jonah ran the opposite way, even when he found himself in a time of trouble. God didn't give up on Jonah. No, we're told that Jonah is spewed out and then sent out to continue on this mission. So he made his way to Nineveh. He came with words that were a little scary. He said, in 40 days, Nineveh will be smashed. And we're told that the people of Nineveh listened. They trusted God. They proclaimed a citywide fast. They dressed in burlap. This was to show their repentance. And the thing about this is everyone did it. The rich, the poor, the obscure, the famous, the leaders, the followers. Everybody did this. Even the king of Nineveh. They began to repent. They turned away from their old selves and they wanted to follow God. And we're told that God actually changed his mind. God didn't follow through with this threat from Jonah. Instead, he offered forgiveness to these people who had turned away from the wrong that they were doing. Now, I've already ruined some of your faithful lives this morning by telling you that it wasn't Jonah and a whale. And I apologize. But I think it's important for us to understand what God was trying to do here. And I'm beginning to do this along with Rob Bell and many in our congregation, trying to understand what God is saying. Because I don't truly believe that this story is about a man and a fish. No, there's a whole lot more going on here. What we actually have is a man that's supposed to be the faithful one, supposed to be, but not. He's the Israelite. His name is Jonah. And instead, he's actually lazy and he's defiant to God. And you have the story of the Assyrians, these folks that are supposedly evil and wicked, They're heathens. They're the ones that are receptive to God's good word. You would think that this is good news. The story could be done. Let's move on from Jonah and never talk about it again. But that's not what's taking place here. You see, what's actually taking place is a bit of an us versus them, an insider versus outsider divide, the one that should be in and those that should stay out. God has love for both of them. God has forgiveness for both of them. And Jonah, Jonah doesn't. You see, Jonah can't forgive. Jonah's struggling with this forgiveness. And so our question becomes, can you forgive your worst enemy and be a channel through which God's grace and love and forgiveness can flow even to your enemies? Can you move on from the past or does the past decide your future? Are our wounds with us forever or can we heal and be set free from them? No, I'm not telling you to just put yourself fully out there. I'm not telling you to open up yourselves to the hard times and the things in our past that aren't great, the things that we don't want to revisit. I'm not telling you to do that. But what I am asking us to do together is to ponder what forgiveness can look like for us and for others. You see, this story, this story that's included in the scriptures, it's both about a person and a nation. Can Jonah and Israel forgive the Assyrians? You see, Jonah's fearful of these people. He has every reason not to extend forgiveness to these folks. They don't deserve it. I don't even think they've asked for it. And yet God is telling us to try to take this step and extend forgiveness. And Jonah is ticked off. Jonah can't believe that God would have forgiveness for these people. There's something about holding on to these things that can be so controlling. Rob Bell says this on page 101, when you haven't forgiven someone who has wronged you and then something good happens to them, when they are blessed or shown mercy or experience favor, it's infuriating. We never want to see others do well, especially if we've been wronged. We never want them to fully experience forgiveness because it's hard for us imagining forgiveness for them. And truly, sometimes... Sometimes it's hard enough to imagine forgiveness for ourselves because we might be the one that needs forgiveness. We might be the one that needs to extend forgiveness, but we don't always want to do this. We like to try to experience it ourselves. We try to look at the most undeserving of folks. And sometimes that might feel like it's us. Sometimes it might feel like others. 
But we want the grace for ourselves. I think we're all there. But we don't always want others to experience it. And I think that's just part of our sinful nature. All of us are saint and sinner, all broken, all in need of forgiveness. And in Jonah 4, God asked this, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? It's a question for Jonah because it's a question for the audience at the time. It was the question for Israel. And the author of Jonah literally wants to know, do you think these people should be forgiven? And so many of the folks are saying, no, they shouldn't be forgiven. They're terrible people. They've wronged us. They've killed our family. They've taken our land. They've looted us. Why? Why would we forgive them? This is the difficult thing of forgiveness. Because those, like the Israelites, who should be open to it, they're not actually open to forgiveness. And those heathens, those broken people that need it, that truly need it, they are. And they're the ones that we assume aren't going to follow through with it. Today, as we hear this story and as we start to break down exactly what is taking place in Jonah, the reason that it's here, the reason that we're learning about it today, I think it would be easy for us to say, Pastor, I'd rather you just focus in on the whale. I'd rather look at this as a black and white story, maybe something that seems far-fetched that I could hear around the campfire, but let's just leave it at that. That seems simpler. But what's actually taking place here is God is calling us, the Israelites, and the Assyrians, and us in Moorhead. God is calling us to live a life of forgiveness. And if we focus so much on the fish and not what's actually taking place in this story, it seems a lot simpler to just look at it as black and white or parable, and honestly, does it matter? What's taking place here is a call for us to forgive. Jonah's been called to forgive The Israelites have been called to forgive. We're called into that too. Can Jonah forgive these folks? Because God can. This is what we continue to wrestle with. Rob says this on 105, which takes us back to the fish. It's easy for the debate about the fish part to provide a distraction from the tensions of the story that actually have the capacity and potential to confront us and disrupt us from the kind of love that can actually transform us into more mature and courageous people, people who love even our enemies. This isn't an easy task. It certainly wasn't for Jonah, and I'm not expecting anybody gathered here today is going to easily live into this call to go and extend forgiveness, to live out a life of love, no questions asked. But this is why we have Christ Jesus, our Lord, in our lives to continue to spur us on, to remind us of what Christ did on the cross for all of humanity. No exceptions. For the rest of our lives, we'll continue to wrestle with what that means. But we can go from this place knowing that God loves us and God's calling us to share that love with others. How might God be calling you to love your enemy today? I'll leave you with this quote from the late Eugene Peterson. He just passed away recently. And at his funeral, his son said this, My dad was a pastor for 40 years, and during that time, he had one sermon. Most Sundays, he said lots of other words, but it always came down to this. God loves you. God is on your side. He's coming after you. He is relentless. God is continuing to go after us, extending grace and love and forgiveness to us. God had this for Jonah. He had it for the Israelites. He had it for the Assyrians. He has it for everybody. And so we ask, God, let this be our prayer today, that you would teach us how to share this with others, this forgiveness. It's what you call us to. We know it's life-changing, and it's not always easy, but it's worth it. God, teach us your ways. And for that we say, thanks be to God. Amen.